Irina says, any thoughts on the following late payment situation? Client is always late to pay, but this time she's three weeks late. Uh, I handle ads for two of her businesses, and we've worked together for close to a year. She said she'd take care of the payment this Friday. I'm inclined to stop any work and pause campaigns until I get paid. Raul says, which ninja techniques are you using now to land local customers for your clients? Mark says, I feel you on this one, my dude. He said, I've had horrible experiences with VA companies. Low tech skill, weak English language skill, ones that did landing page design, just use Canva templates. Many lack beyond basic uh, SEO skill. I had to go back and always double check and redo much of the work. Are we live there? There we go, we got the shocker. Don't ever grow up like me, kids. That is the fact of life right there. Anyways, we are back talking about agency growth and all the good things associated with it. For those of you guys who are new here, by the way, a lot of people know me because I wrote this uh, best-selling book on Amazon and, uh, you know, grown a few agencies and helped a few thousand people to do that. So um, quick little announcement just before we get rock and rolling on all your questions this week, guys. Um, so I've been working on a couple of things. So one of those, as you guys have seen, uh, I've just seen too many people have horror stories about Stripe. So I've been working on some good, solid alternatives. I'm still looking on some international solutions because I know not everybody's in Canada or the United States. Lots of you guys are in the UK, Australia. We got folks in India. We, you know, we got folks all over. Um, but I'll be working on some solutions. I also have been working on a done for you email list i know a lot of you guys know that you should follow up with prospects and you should send them automated stuff and you should nurture them over time but you just haven't and so i built that for you and uh it's uh, just waiting on a couple of technical setup kind of details from my va and that'll be ready to go and then also um we are expanding in the wolf pack and i'll tell you because i've been building some really cool ai tools so that uh you know like the ability to generate cash has gotten a lot easier like we can um, do lots of cool shit like uh, upsells to existing clients and things you can deliver for them as well as scripts and stuff you can like you can literally just put in a person's details and it'll write a message for them so like we've got some really really cool shit i won't go into too much detail i guess maybe i'll talk about that towards the end but if you guys are interested in that you can check out the link below i've not updated that video in forever but i plan on it uh this week and our man Cole is here, my tag team partner, world heavyweight champions, tag team champions of the world. Anyways, let's get into the good stuff. I need a drink before I say my line. That's just water, in case you guys are wondering. I know it looks like I'm just hammering coffee, but it's just water. I live in a desert, man. You got to drink a lot of water. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, Frankie Finn proudly brings you our weekly Q and A. All right, let's talk growing agencies. Who do we got up first? It looks like our man Oscar Müller. That's like an awesome German name. I don't know if you're actually German. You could it could be a Swedish last name, my man. But if it is German, I said it like a champ. He says, hey, Frankie Finn and other savvy lifestyle agency owners, I'm looking to brainstorm the most efficient 80-20 more beach, less laptop way of offering Facebook ads management for typical home services businesses. Let's take painters, for example. Most painters don't really need custom built campaigns, a proven campaign, slightly customized for them is probably good enough in many cases. How would you structure or productize such an 80-20 Facebook ad service? The goal to make it as easy uh, to fulfill as possible, while, while ideally involving the client as little as possible. I was thinking of the following, but I'm sure you can think of more slash better ways. N number one, we run ads from a generic local niche page that you control. Two, use Upex, load it up with proven templates, show them how it works, and let them uh, customize their campaigns uh, for them. Which one of these would you choose and why? Uh, what other options am I missing that you would prefer over these two? The reason I'm asking a lot of these home service businesses often have a terrible online presence. Their website often looks like it was made with Microsoft front page in early 2000s and hasn't been updated since. Their Facebook page isn't even a Facebook business page, but a profile. They haven't posted anything in months, sometimes years. I use Frankie's terms. They're barefoot as fuck and don't show any signs of looking to buy shoes anytime. And their marketing budget is tiny if they have one at all. So on paper, they make some pretty terrible clients. I'm not looking to save them. I'm also not looking for to base my whole business around them. I'm, I'm basically looking at this as a possible down sell or foot in the door type offer for certain cases where it can make sense. All right, Oscar, there's a lot to unpack on what you just said, homie. Um, so firstly, I think one of the things that I, 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 I wish I knew better when I first started 
is that you do not want every client. I, like just because you can go get home services people does not mean you should. And I'll tell you the trifecta of what I look for in clients, and this is universally true across any industry. And I told this to a lot of people, and it's like it's made a big difference. One is only work with people who are actively spending money today. Otherwise, you got to make two sales. You should spend money, and with me, and it's the you should spend money that's the hard sale uh, to make. As where when you deal with like, uh, and so what will happen, by the way, as a side effect of this, it doesn't matter what niche you go into you're gonna serve the top 10 to 20% of that niche. So if you're working with personal injury lawyers, you're working with the top ones who spend all the money. If you're working with painters, you work with painters who spend all the money. If you're working with fence guys, you're working with the top, like that means for every 100 home services people, you would not want 80 or 90 of them, right? Like I don't think enough people really understand that. Like take real estate agents, for example. I know it's not your niche, but I just wanna illustrate the point is like, Real estate ag agents is a very high failure rate business, kind of like ours, because it, it's a low barrier to entry. Like anybody can take a weekend course and be a real estate agent. But if you look over like five or 10 years, how many of them actually make it as real estate agents? Like very few. Like if you talk to 20 quote unquote real estate agents and then measure it out five or 10 years, like maybe one or two out of 20 like actually fucking make it. So those one or two are your target clients. The ones, and this is like a thing is like, if they're spending money, they're already winning. They have working offers. They have working sales processes. That That's what that behavior indicates. And so you're simply amplifying what's working. Second thing I look for is, do they have a team in place? And ideally like a team related to sales and closing, uh, those kind of things. Because what happens is a team indicates a behavior that they're willing to spend money to solve problems. Right, like a lot of times when you're alone, do it yourself, or you don't have money to spend on hiring help, and so you don't value hiring help. Right, so behaviorally, once they have a team and they're used to paying people, it indicates I would rather pay money and get other people to solve problems for me. Third thing you look for, and this is a thing that you can't always like easily measure, but is attitude. Like, a sim a sim like simple terms, we want a no assholes policy, no motherfuckers in there. Right, um, so when I say that your general idea is right that essentially what you're asking is like can i have one facebook ad or a couple of facebook ads that work that i just kind of customize for each client like and i'm basically just doing the same thing and the answer is yes absolutely in fact i would say if you're running facebook ads that's the fucking point you're that you're supposed to have a leveraged asset and this is a thing i've talked a lot about with our mastermind folks but so you guys know it's the idea that you want to be paid for your assets and your tools and not for me the service provider right so what i mean by that in your case it's like i want to be paid because i own working facebook ad creatives that i can rent out not because i'm the world's greatest facebook ad guy who will solve all your problems and so the other piece that's kind of missing from yours like strategically is that you have to focus it down to a common outcome that most people in your space would want so like painters painters like they could probably paint a closet and they could probably paint a, a brand new house like all things being equal like i don't know what that is for them but they probably want like brand new houses to paint or big housing jobs or or maybe even commercial jobs i don't know what that is i mean you have to ask a painter but like when you figure that out like let's just say it's like full residential painting then you're you're not selling facebook ads management you're selling i'll get you full residential painting jobs with my ad library that already works right that's what you're ultimately selling is the outcome and the delivery vehicle makes it super easy for them to like figure it out without any sort of details paul says no mofos allowed cracks me up my dude um so anyways so the basic idea that you have one or a couple of ads that you're renting out again and again is exactly the game that's how you're able to systematize it and scale it relatively easy because you're not doing 20 different things every time you get hired you're just doing like five ten basic things setting them up updating them monitoring the ads etc uh in each of those is a process now what trips people up is if you go after the non-buyers in the space who don't spend money the broke as fuck segment of the market and try and like help them and save them like they cannot be helped and saved like i mentioned this before but gordon ramsay okay i watched too much kitchen nightmares i've probably seen every episode for those of you guys never seen kitchen nightmares gordon goes into a struggling restaurant and he fixes it up and he like often confronts the owners and sometimes people get fired and he helps them uh renovate the building so it looks nice he helps them get a whole new menu and sometimes they even bring in staff help well if you look at the numbers one year out for every 20 businesses gordon ramsay goes in to help with restaurants 
19 of them are out of business. They were, in other words, they were failing before he showed up, and only in 1 in 20 cases did he make any hill of beans a difference. And the reason is because it's just the wrong client selection. You, you can't, you, you don't turn people who like have lost their passion or maybe never had it in the first place or just have me too businesses and suck at closing leads and don't really have that good of food or don't really have that good of deliverable and turn them into like just all time winners. You know, I've told this story before, but it really, really illustrates the point, okay? So we were trying to help roofers, Dan, Crystal, and me back in the day, I wanna say like 10 years ago, uh, maybe even longer than that. I'm old, like 12, 13 years ago, might be more accurate. And I remember we got the idea that we would rank, build and rank websites, the old rank and rent model. So we had these roofers, and I remember uh, we generated a phone call for this roofer named Eddie, and the phone call basically went a little something like this is Eddie's wife picks up the phone. Now, mind you, there is an ad that says we are like the top roofing company in the world. And Eddie picks up the phone, or Eddie's wife picks up the phone, and it sounds like she's just eaten a carton of cigarettes and says, hello? And the guy's confused. It's like, yeah, is this five-star roofing? Hello? Uh, yeah, is this five-star roofing? Yeah, yeah, one second roofing, one sec. And then she goes, Eddie, come answer the fucking phone! And they proceed to argue. Now, I have the call recording, so I can hear this entire thing. Dan and I are like, uh, and Eddie's like, why are you always doing that? You crazy bitch. You crazy bitch, man. You crazy. And they're like, there's like seven minutes of that. Finally, Eddie picks up the phone. Guy waits the whole seven minutes, listens to the whole argument. Says, uh, yeah, is this a five-star roofing? And Eddie's like, yeah, yeah, you need a roof. Now, you would be shocked to learn that Eddie did not close that deal. And I propose to you, nobody in the world changes Eddie. Right, like Eddie is not suddenly going to become Warren Buffett. He's just not right. So, so like, sixty percent of the game is client selection. So, don't miss that detail. Like, it's a small detail because if you get it fucking wrong, there's nothing you can do to help people. Nothing, right? Because like, even Gordon Ramsay, like, so again, like, I say this, like, you know, not as judgments of people, but just strictly in the game of business. But running an agency is about helping winners win more. It is not turning losing businesses and losing offers into winners. That's a 1 in 20 success rate game, even for the best in the world, right? If you got 20 clients who are already winning, your success rates are going to be like 19 out of 20 because it, it has more to do with them than it does with you. So I want you guys to really think about that, Oscar. But as far as your basic idea, and, and I would suggest, yes, use Upex because, man, it makes it a whole lot easier. You start with winning ads. You start with winning creatives. You can license those babies out and sell them to oblivion uh, and, and you know not have to figure all that out. But having said that, like we're, we're, not, tr we're not turning losers into winners. Irina says, any thoughts on the following late payment situation? Client is always late to pay, but this time she's three weeks late. Uh, I handle ads for two of her businesses and we've worked together for close to a year. She said she'd take care of the payment this Friday. I'm inclined to stop any work and pause campaigns until I get paid. All right, Irina, I'm gonna answer this as a twofold question, okay? So let's talk about the, the, the what I believe is the more important thing, the learning lesson in this, which is essentially what Mark Kelly said as a reply to that, which is, Account like accounts receivable is a very low value task and one of the easiest ways you can get that out of your machine is to just do automatic recurring billing like don't chase anybody for money don't at all and and because otherwise you're there's this conflict I used to see this a lot with divorce attorneys for example they often like charge a retainer and then what would happen is when they would try and call the client almost always it was like hey you need to pay your bill and so the clients would stop answering the phone and then they couldn't proceed with their divorce because they needed they also needed information about the divorce and so there was like, this hamster wheel where they're on where they're constantly chasing people for money and my answer to that is don't <laughs> don't do it like set up automated recurring billing and just tell them like this is why i say 10 percent of clients by the way are awesome clients because they're just really cool awesome people and 10 and they just know what it means to be a good client 10 percent of clients are just miserable fucking assholes because that's how they are we're talking just strictly attitude 80 percent of them will go the way you tell them so what i mean by that is if you just tell them like hey this is how we do it we do automated recurring billing sign up here here and here most people will not ask any questions or give you any pushback if you just set the frame that this is how it's normally done. So in the future, this is how it's normally done. We do automated recurring billing and don't deal with that issue. Now, as far as the dealing with it now, um, I would see if you could send a nice message and say, you know, uh, to be honest, I'm not the best at, at billing and blah, blah, blah. Can we just set it up on an automated thing? And, and you, you may have to like give her a discount 
to set it up automated so you don't have to chase her anymore. And then as far as should you stop the work, probably. It's a really gray area, to be honest. I've heard all kinds of different opinions on it. And I've, I've been in the situation where I've done both. I've done like, yes, continue the work. No, don't continue the work. Kind of depends a lot on the individual client. I don't have like an easy answer for you on that, but you may want to. You may just say, hey, like we have to put work. Um, we had actually one like a couple weeks ago where uh, you know, guy just hadn't paid his website bill. So I just like, <laughs> took it took the site down and just wait for him to come contact me and say my site's not working so yeah you haven't paid your bill um so you know anyways i i don't necessarily have a, an easy answer for that other than like don't let that happen again let that be a one-time issue in your agency um this was what i wanted to talk about it wasn't really a question but but i wanted i wanted i think there's something useful for you guys to extract here so Brett posted an image. He says, something for you, Frankie Finn, LOL. It's a guy named Randall who says, this will be the cold message you ever uh, get, I promise. I can get you 500 plus sales calls booked every month. Would you be open to chat? And he says, who the fuck wants 500 sales calls a month? I'd rather shit my hands uh, than clap, than chat to 500 different people in a month. Yeah, 500 people is a lot. But, but what I wanted to show you guys in this is for those of you guys who've never read Eugene Schwartz, Breakthrough Advertising, which I consider personally to be the most impactful copywriting book I've ever read. I've lot of, read a lot of the old, like kind of all-time greats. And one of the things Eugene Schwartz says is that all markets go through cycles. And so in stage one is you're literally the first person who's ever made a thing like this. And so all you have to do in stage one is tell people what it is and what it does. Like it's that easy. So like if you think about like the soda world, when Coca-Cola was like, you know, numero uno expanding, like they just have to like, it's a really good drink, try it. That's it, That's, that was their messaging. And what happens is over time, markets will evolve to stage two. And stage two is when the promises start to get a little bigger a little more exaggerated and, and they eventually stretch the bounds of believability. So like if you look at this particular ad or this particular message, it's just not believable, right? Like I'm gonna get you 500 booked appointments. Like even if you could, you wouldn't want that. But like if, even 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 if that were true, like it doesn't, doesn't seem believable that somebody's gonna get you 500 calls next month, right? Um, so what happens there is, um, in stage two, the, the promises get bigger and bigger. And like you see this in weight loss where it's like lose 10 pounds or lose five pounds in five days. Then it's like, you know, eventually it evolves to like lose 100 pounds in your underwear, eating chocolate balls or chocolate bars all day with our new chocolate only diet. And it gets ridiculous, right? And so what happens is then a market enters stage three. And this is the part that will be the most useful for you is how do you go from stage two to stage three? And it is, you create what Eugene Schwartz calls a new mechanism, which is literally a different way of achieving a result, a different process. So you see this in weight loss when like over the years, like green coffee bean comes out, or we got a new diet where you don't eat any carbs and that's the reason it works. Or there's the paleo diet and they always have a new mechanism as the reason. I used to, uh, do p90x back in the day um I, I like did it twice survived 90 days didn't continue on with it i'm one of those dudes but but anyways one of the things p90x is they say hey when you exercise you plateau and then what happens is what you did stops working and, and the reason is because you're doing the same exercises over and over and your body adjusts so we created something we call muscle confusion which is you're constantly doing new exercises and new routines so the gains never stop because your body's always confused about what you're doing and that's why we're able to get crazy results so the promise is we're going to get you crazy fitness results but the new mechanism the muscle confusion makes that a whole new believable thing and then what happens is if you're in stage three long enough, there will be more copycats. Someone will say, we can do muscle confusion cheaper. We can do it faster. We can do better. We can do more muscle confusion. We can make 20 pounds. We can make 20, 30 pounds, 50 pounds, 100 pounds. And what happens is the promises again get unbelievable. And the way you get out of unbelievable promises, and I say this because a lot of you guys feel like you have to promise unbelievable shit to clients, is not to up the promise but to invent a new mechanism that takes you out of the category you used to be in. So like for you guys, a lot of you guys found me because I'm the loom video guy. Is that not a new mechanism? Is that not different than all the other sales shit you heard before in your life? Right, everybody else is saying, you know, um, 
got to do all these billion calls, booked appointments. And then you hear me say, like, we don't do any fucking calls. Like, we just send people a video and they buy our shit, which, by the way, is how it's been for, like, five or six years. But that's a new mechanism. All of a sudden, your expectations, the sense of believability all gets reset with a new mechanism. So for you guys, you have to figure out what your new mechanism is. When, when, the, when you're in a market where the promises are just getting straight up fucking ridiculous, like the booked appointment bros are just getting straight up ridiculous. Right? So like the way out of that is, hey, we figured out a new script on LinkedIn that works. Or we figured out a new process using Instagram that's different than what everybody else is doing. And that's how we're able to get X number of booked appointments, right? So by changing that mechanism, you make your shit believable again. And so I hope that's like, it's kind of an advanced copywriting uh, trick. But what happens is almost all of you guys are in stage four markets where it's been beat to shit. People are jaded as fuck and the promises just get bigger and more exaggerated and less believable. And there's a tendency if the guy next to you is offering 100 booked appointments that you have to offer 110 or 150 or let's go big and go 300, whatever. And in reality, you have to figure out where your shit is different and come up with a unique mechanism and say, hey, we figured out a different, easier way to get people on calls using... And, and that's where the magic happens and that's where you guys step out of that box and all of a sudden your promises will catch on because... They've never tried muscle confusion before. Even if they've tried to exercise before and it didn't work and they plateaued, I've never tried muscle confusion. So they're willing to give it a chance in ways. This is why like a lot of times just taking your agency and, and being the new media person, meaning like, hey, I'm the first one who does TikTok or I'm the first one who does, um, you know, whatever the latest, greatest fucking platform is. Um, hey, we're going to do short videos where everybody else is doing long videos. Just taking that thing and making it new makes it believable again, right? Because, yeah, I heard shorts are all the rage and they don't have a box to put you in. So almost always if you guys are stuck with big promises, new mechanism is the answer to that. And it, there's an art to doing that. But if you nail the new mechanism, like your shit becomes more believable, easier, and you don't have to promise the fucking moon. You can actually promise what you can do that's actually real and achievable. Um, Raul says... Which ninja techniques are you using now to land local customers for your clients? Uh, just so you guys don't, I read that as Ninja Turtles. And I'm an old school Ninja Turtles dude. Like I grew up eating pizza because the Ninja Turtles ate pizza and wanting to learn karate even though my mom was too poor for that. You know, uh, <laughs> That's terrible karate. Um, but ninja techniques for getting, uh, getting your clients' businesses local. For, for all, all of you guys who work for brick and mortar, I'm going to tell you the easiest hack on all of this, okay? It's the offer, especially with local businesses. There are some businesses where you have to educate people what it is and what it does before you can even make an offer. So like, for example, like in our world, if somebody comes out with a new AI software, before you can even buy it, they probably have to explain to you what it does and why it, why it does it and then make you an offer, okay? This is not true for local businesses. By and large, people know what a massage therapist does. They know what a fucking dentist does. They know what a plumber does. They know what the, the local bakery has, right? Like for the most part. So the secret, if you got a bakery, is make an offer and say, we got 99 cents fucking super cinnamon sugar donuts. Come on down, you can get one for 99 cents. We got, you know, and, and you may even have to do a loss leader where you do something just to get them in the door to capture them for the second thing. And I've seen, by the way, bakeries, like as a real practical example, I remember Perry Marshall back in the day helped bakeries crush it by just giving away a free cookie or a free brownie. And then, of course, people who come in and take the free cookie or brownie often feel compelled to buy other things. But local businesses, the, the easiest way to sell shit for your clients is to come up with a cool offer. And then for the most part, it's uh, it's just like amplify that offer somehow. SEO, pay per click, Facebook ads. But like step one is come up with an offer. And a lot of times these these businesses have generic fucking promises. So I think of like the water damage restoration space where most of the people basically say like you know twenty four seven we'll come and give you a quote, right? Well, if if somebody has like like think about this if it's raining in their fucking living room and they don't know how to make it stop, and and like it's damaging more and more by the second, what do you think the most appealing promise is going to be to them? And the answer is fast, right? So if I, I was a restoration guy, I'm clearly not. But if I was, like I would be like, I'm the fat, like I'll be there quicker than anybody else, guaranteed, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, however long it takes to fucking drive there, right? So you can always engineer a promise based on, on you know, the needs of your marketplace. And not every market is a speed-driven offer. Uh, that one just happens to be because it's emergency service, right? Um, so I say that to you guys because if you want to hack it, 
Come up with the best offer in your industry, and people, lo and behold, will buy your shit. Because for the most part, people don't need educated about what a local business is. They just need an irresistible reason to come try it, right? Like, so, like, people don't need educated what a fucking restaurant is. Just, like, tell them, like, if you come in today, we got a half-priced, you know, lasagna, normally twelve ninety nine and six ninety nine for this beautiful lasagna, which, you know, Luigi over here has been making all day. That's, that's really it, right? It doesn't need to be super complicated. Our man Cole says, bought the Ninja Turtles arcade back for my son's uh, Switch. will never grow up. <laughs> I'm with you, dude. This growing up shit is overrated. Uh, I'll get old physically, but I will not mentally grow up. Uh, Chandler says, do you DM the prospect before sending them the famous Loom video? Um, so I, I kind of wrote about this a little bit the other day, Chandler. Which is all high ticket sales do not begin where people think they do. They begin with curiosity, and curiosity in a high-ticket sale usually is a form of, hmm, that sounds interesting. Can you tell me more about it? Hmm. Uh, okay. Send a video over, right? Like, it, it, They don't always say it with those words, but what they're saying is, hmm, I'm mildly curious to intensely curious somewhere on that spectrum. Tell me a little bit more about it. And so the way we begin every Loom conversation is with curiosity, and the way we do that is very, very simple is we create a summary of the offer that is to go at the end of the Loom video, usually without all the details, and say, would you be interested in hearing more about that? So like, in, in, I'll give you a real example. Like we had a Loom video for many, many years that we helped uh, personal injury attorneys to get motorcycle cases running Facebook ads. Well, the offer at the end of the video is for uh, 2,500 bucks a month, we'll be your Facebook ads person running that. So when I create a little, what I would call a hand raiser, the hand raiser is, Hey, I got an idea for you to get motorcycle cases in your practice, and I put the details together in a little five-minute video. Would it be cool to tell you more about it? If they don't say I'm curious, like we don't send it. Like they're not going to buy it. If they're not even mildly curious about how they can get motorcycle cases, you're not going to be able to send it later either. Uh, there used to be a term for this back in the day. I learned all this from Dave Miz. Uh, in the dating world, they call it an IOI, which is an indicator of interest. So I have a friend. He would when he would go to the bar, he would always do a once loop around. And he would look for the girls that kind of gave him a smile and looked kind of friendly and looked like kind of inviting like they wanted him to talk to him. And he would take those IOIs, indicators of interest, and take them as curiosity and go strike up conversations with the three or four girls he knew, like at least were friendly to him and wanted to, you know, like potentially, you know, learn more about him and stuff like that. So if you talk to people on a Loom video, like it's not like forcefully like, you know, like it's not, it's not rape. It's not like... Take this Loom video, whether you like it or not, lay down and you're going to like it. And it's more like, hey, we got an idea to help you do blank. And, and this is this is uh, a thing I wish more people understood, but the, the, the basic methodology is we always give away ideas for free and charge for implementation. So like in my case, like I'll give you the idea. I'll show you how you can go generate motorcycle cases on your own. But if you just want us to do that for you, this is what that would look like. And so the way we do that is like when I'm showing up in somebody's DM or to message them or to have a conversation, I'm really just offering an idea. Like that's all I, fundamentally I'm doing is like, I got an idea to help you get this, this outcome or solve this problem. You know, would, would you even be interested in that? And that's really it. It sounds so simple, but it's like sometimes the, the hardest stuff to do is the simplest stuff. And what most people do, by the way, is the opposite of that. I get pitched a lot of stuff cold, and uh, the cold shit is like people write me fucking novels. Like, I am, we are, our company is blah, 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 we think blah, 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 it, our pricing is, we are great at this, you should call us, here's 87 testimonials, blah, blah, blah. And I haven't even said, like, I'm curious, tell me more. Right. And so like it just turns you off as where somebody says, hey, like, hey, Frankie, I had an idea for you to to like, I'll give you a real one. Somebody said I had an idea for you to sell more of your book. Like I'm a big fan of Beyond the Agency Box and I'd like to help you sell your book. Can I tell you about it now? I, I have invited that sale in the door. Tell me more. I'm curious. What would that look like? How would that work? And then the Loom video is just answering the questions they would want to know. You know, um, what's it going to do for me? Will it work for me personally? How does it work? How much is it? What do I get for how much is it? Okay, that sounds interesting. How do we what, how do we work together? What does the next step look like? A Loom video is just answering the questions preemptively that they would ask you in a sales call and doing more of it visually than with words because people get you a lot faster visually. Like for example, if I say I'm an author, that's one level of understanding. But if I say I'm an author and you can see a book, 
you get it faster, right? So the other magic of a loom video is we're doing a lot of advanced kind of sales techniques and we're doing it with videos. So, or we're doing it with images so people get what, and the point of it is it allows them to integrate what it is you're doing for them like way faster, right? Like I used to spend 45 minutes on the phone trying to explain Facebook ads to attorneys the minute I just showed them a picture of like, we're gonna run ads like these. And they go, oh, okay, I see what it kind of, okay, that makes sense to me, right? Like they just got it. So that's that's the Loom video or process in a nutshell. Having said that, um, I do not do any one-to-one -one prospecting with Loom videos anymore, even though a lot of people do use it for that. And we even have like software built where you can mass personalize those videos. So like uh, Pitch Lane, for example, can help you to mass personalize it. But for me personally, what we do is we go find audience owners in our space. We co-create content for them uh, with their audience, a very specific type of content that is essentially giving the way uh, the ideas that we charge to implement. So for example, like I'd give away, like here's how you can get motorcycle cases using Facebook ads. And then a percentage of people on the back end will say, hey, can you just do that for me? And I say, hey, I put together the details in the video. And I wish more people understood this because the Loom videos are fucking awesome. And obviously I love them and they work. And they work for a lot of people, like hundreds and hundreds of people have messaged me over the years like, holy shit, I sold some stuff through video. Um, but the real magic to me is, is actually what happens before in the same way that like if you ask a girl to marry you, it's usually not the what you said at the moment of asking that did it. It's everything that came before it. And to me, it's like it's actually the the getting the credibility of the audience owner and the creating content that like you know, in many ways helps them get a result just through the content and is valuable to them is actually a lot of ways where the sale is made before the Loom video. And in my world, we call that pre, pre-selling. And it's a, it, I believe it's kind of a lost art, but if you know how to pre-sell stuff, people are sold even before they get to the Loom video, which is why, by the way, sometimes we don't even send a video. Sometimes we just close people in text. They just like send us an email and we go, well, it'll be this much, blah, blah, blah. And they say, okay, let's do it. And they haven't even seen a Loom video. Um, but anyways, I hope that's helpful, my dude. Um, just gonna put a note here. Okay, Mark says, I feel you on this one, my dude. He said, I've had horrible experiences with VA companies, low tech skill, weak English language skill, ones that did landing page design, just use Canva templates. Many lacked beyond basic uh, SEO skill. I had to go back and always double check and redo much of the work. Um, so I'm gonna give you my uh, virtual assistant formula in a nutshell here right now so that you don't have that happen and you don't have that uh, be your experience and just so you guys know everything i learned about this i learned from reading john jonas who is the owner of onlinejobs.ph i learned from reading his free stuff i've never hired john i guess i've given him money for his website like they they, they charge a fee to post ads there but everything i learned about hiring vas i learned from him and so there there are a couple of prerequisites you need to have good VAs. <clears throat> and I believe the two most important ones that people miss, which is why so many people have miserable experiences. Thing number one is you have to have, and this is true even if you hire like top tier domestic talent, you have to have your processes mapped out before you hire somebody. So like for example, <clears throat> I would try and hire article writers for a lot of years because SEO used to involve a lot of article writing and like i didn't by and large end up with good article writers <laughs> like the opposite i ended up like people who had shitty english like you described and didn't quite understand the subject matter and so we had to create a process for like how do we actually come up with good articles and what i realized is i perused like a bunch of the top industry magazines and i found articles about the most popular surgeries and they went into detail about like seven or eight different things like so like breast implants how much did they charge uh, how much, how did they cost? What does it look like? What can I expect? How long will I be in pain? And so we just mapped all those things out. And then eventually we said, if you're going to write a top article on this thing, you have to like cover all of these things. And then what we found is like not every VA could hack it, but like 50, 60% of them could follow a template and instructions like once we had it. And there, therefore we had way better hires. So almost always when people bring in VAs, it's like, okay, go do some SEO, go solve the problem. And that's like treating them like a domestic employee. And I even think like domestic employees aren't that good at this either, although they better understand your English and get it. But if you want to be successful long term, like you need fucking instructions. You need what we would call an SOP, a standard operating procedure. You need detailed instructions of how you do that shit 
before you bring them in the door. Otherwise, like, they're not going to know what the fuck to do. And they're going to be like, boss, what do you want me to do today? And that's how I ran my first agency, by the way. Pure chaos. Don't recommend it. Um, s- secondly, by the way, I just, like, uh, um, this is why I say a good agency is boring. Like, you, they have instructions. It's in uh, uh, project management. They know what they're supposed to do every day. They're checking boxes as they're getting stuff done. They're making updates. Like, everything that's supposed to be getting done is getting done. If you don't have that set up, like, you ain't going to succeed. Now, the second thing that I believe is also a game changer is um, um, what John Jonas calls trial assignments. Okay? So, a trial assignment is very, very simple. Is Test people on the thing they're actually going to do. And I, Perry Marshall called this the audition. He said, if you want to go play for a new band, like they don't go, well, give us your resume. Give us five references. Uh, let us talk to five other people you've been in a band with. We'll call your references and hopefully you'll hear back from us. That would be a really stupid way of finding out if like, you guys could make music together. A better way is like, okay, you get the drums, you get the guitar, you get one bass, let's see, and you see if you can make songs together, right? Like that's it. There's no better way to learn if you're going to make good music together if, other than trying to make music together. And so Seth Godin says, I, I, can't know if I, uh, I can't know if I should hire you until after we already work together. And so a trial assignment is a way to work together on a small scale and figure out. And the best trial assignments are like things they're going to do. So sometimes like uh, recently I hired a, a person who posts on social media for us. So I gave them like a couple of things to go post on social media just on their own, like uh, not on my account, but like can they follow the process? Can they do the hashtags? Can they create the thumbnails? Can they create title tags? Can they do the headlines? Can they follow the prompts we've given on ChatGPT? And Lo and behold, if they do the test assignment, they're probably going to be pretty okay at the real one because the real thing is just more of what they did in the test assignment, right? It's like literally just more of it. So if you're in a situation where it seems like every VA is an idiot, I'm here to, to brain on your parade and tell you it's probably you. It's probably your setup. And if you, if you own that and take responsibility, you can fix it. You can develop your processes and you can develop your screening processes. Most people's uh, hiring sucks for those two reasons is they... they um, they like essentially people don't know what they're supposed to do after they're hired it's ambiguous it's vague it's unspecific and they're being hired because like there's an idea in the owner's head that they want them to solve and then secondly because um they they like they don't screen them properly they don't test people to see like um i i again i watch too much gordon ramsay but like he has a show called hell's kitchen where he yells at people and it's like every reality show where they start with like 20 motherfuckers and they vote one person off the island each consecutive week and then eventually they're left with one person and that one person is usually like really fucking good why because they've been through a series of battle tests to see that they can actually do the job can you actually cook they make you cook can you make your own recipe they make you do a recipe can you prep they make you prep can you use leftovers there's a competition for using leftovers right like they test them on the real shit they're gonna do and that's why they end up with good people and obviously they've turned that into entertainment and there's all kinds of spin-offs but essentially they're also like that's their that's their talent audition, right? So, like, test people. And usually I pay them for the thing, like, five or ten bucks for a, a, a trial assignment. And you'll end up, like, it'll cost you 100 to 200 bucks to, to run the test. But you're going to end up with way better people. And you'll have your pick of people who actually know what the fuck they're doing. Um, Chandler says, I'm hungry for more clients in a new Cairo agency I started. Going to start the Loom video strategy as well as some ads into a VSL and book a call. I think speaking at events will come later. Uh, any other client acquisition strategies I should be considering? So contrary to what people think, Chandler, there are not actually that many different client getting strategies. Okay? So there is what you kind of hinted at, one-to-one outreach. That is one that is probably the most popular in our industry. And by the way, for the reason that it's the most popular to everybody else, it's the least popular with me personally. And I'll tell you why, for very simple reasons, it's the most uh, congested, it has the most amount of competition, and it's the hardest to reach people through. That does not mean it can't be done, by the way, but it's, I believe it's the hardest way. There is paid ads, Facebook, YouTube, Google. I'm a fan of all of them, by the way. A lot of people think like one bled. The, the right platform to use depends on where your market is. So like, obviously you're going after chiropractors, but where chiropractors are is different than where landscapers are. Um, Another strategy to get people is content. You put stuff out there, people discover your content, they come to you. That's exactly what this is right now. 
this is me making content, just so you guys know, in a way that's kind of easy and for me to do. And then my favorite way, which is the way nobody talks about, but this is my personal favorite way. And by the way, one-to-one -one outreach, by the way, can immediately become better by just changing media. So a lot of times we do direct mail, and our direct mail works really, really good, and it just works because nobody gets any letters. But my favorite one, coming back to it, is what I call one-to-many outreach. Okay, and the difference between one to many outreach and one to one outreach is one to one, you are trying to find chiropractors one at a time. And there is some merit for it and it does work, but man, I've never found anything that's more of a grind than that. And I always compare it to back in the day, my first ever jobs, 13 years old, selling chocolate bars door to door for the blind. That's what one to one outreach is. We'd knock on five, six, seven, eight hours worth of doors every day, walking around carrying a heavy ass cooler and you get lots of doors slammed in your face and get told lots of fuck off and you get lots of nobody's home and where nobody answers and then every now and then you sell a chocolate bar, right? And and it does work, but man, like I can't think of a bigger grind. What one to many outreach is to me is once a month, our manager would drive over to the local grocery store, a place called Zares in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, and we would go to Zares, and he would ask the manager, is it okay if we sell our chocolate bars outside? We're doing it for the blind, it's for a good cause. And the guy would say, always say, yeah, go for it. And we'd put two kids at every main entrance, and we would all be sold out of chocolates in 10 or 15 minutes. Now, the reason that works so fast is not because our sales pitch got better. It is not because <laughs> Like our outreach message tripled in effectiveness. The opposite. What happened is we identified where the buying audiences were and we stood in front of them. Now, I'm a big believer that buying audiences in every sort of uh, business to business kind of marketing space is really only in seven places. Okay, the buying audiences, they're buying expertise, they're going into coaching programs, they're joining masterminds, they're hiring the top Cairo consultant. S secondly, is um, they're also buying like what I would call information, right? Like uh, somebody is putting out the podcast in the industry, somebody wrote a book in your industry, somebody has a top Cairo YouTube channel. Then they're also joining communities, right? Like on Facebook and on LinkedIn and maybe even some real life stuff. Um, they also have industry associations, the Cairo Association of America, the, the California Cairo Association or whatever, things like that. Uh, they also buy software and tools, right? Somebody is selling them software and tools. And when I say tools, I mean like real physical stuff too, like the benches that people lay on or the fancy Cairo chairs or those skeletons they all have hanging up with the disjointed spine that they show everybody. Somebody's selling that to them. And then also they, they go to live events, like somebody's got a conference, somebody's got a workshop, somebody's got a meetup already in that space. And then also they buy other marketing services. Somebody's selling Cairo people websites, somebody sell Cairo people. Uh, so what I do, which is different than what most people do, is I like to message the people who already have audiences of buyers and find out ways we can co-create valuable stuff for their audience. And usually the way I do that is with like some sort of free training or let me give your people an idea. And the idea is about the thing we sell. So like if I sold Facebook ads, I'm gonna teach Kairos how to do their own Facebook ads. And I know a percentage of them will just say, can you just do that for me? But the, 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 the benefit of doing it this way is you get to stand in front of the buying audience. They all come to you. You do not have to pursue it one-to-one. -one. And from an energy efficiency point of view, when, I, when we did one-to-one -one outreach in the real world, like eight hours a day of fucking knocking on doors, when we went to the grocery store, we were sold out in 10 or 15 minutes, right? And it's no different when you do it online. Like you can send one message to the top Cairo podcast in the whole industry, create an episode with them, and don't be surprised when you have 10 chiropractors to work with by next week because they listen to the podcast and we're like that was really insightful and we need what you offer and they come to you and it starts with identifying where those audience is already and by the way it's just as free as one-to-one -one outreach it's less work but what's different about it is um, with one-to-one -one outreach it's a direct buy my shit kind of pitch with one-to-many outreach it's a let me create something valuable for your audience and uh, again to make it really simple Ideas equal free, implementation equals money. If you sell SEO to chiropractors, teach them how to rank their website without you and a percentage of them are just gonna say, Chandler, can you just do that for me?
So that's my favorite way of doing it. There, that's and, I, and I'll tell you why because it's the only one that energetically makes the most sense. And then what happens is is the crossover for me happens is once I have like a media piece. So like when you see me in the industry association with a free training that they've endorsed. That is what I then turn into a paid ad because I get all their borrowed credibility and trust. And those ads just tend to work way better because people trust the Cairo Association of America way more than they just trust some asshole marketer off the street sending them a cold DM on Instagram going, buy my shit because it's the latest, greatest shit to buy. So there are lots of ways to do it, Chandler. If, if you got the money, paid ads is usually a good testing place. As a general rule, 50 or 100 bucks like that's what I use as a test budget for like any new idea. So if you if you spend 70 bucks and nobody raises their hand and says I'm interested in what you're offering, they probably won't buy it later and so you need to tweak it. Um, and a lot of it is just tweaking it to find out what chiropractors actually want. But um, paid ads, you're gonna do one-to-one -one outreach, you're gonna put out content. And by the way, content is actually the most effective one long-term but it's the one people do the least because it takes time to work. Like pretty much like when you put out content, nothing happens for the first three months. And so almost everybody gives up in the first 90 days. But if you do it long-term, you eventually become like a niche sort of celebrity, which by the way is my favorite kind of celebrity. Like I heard a, I heard a thing by Eminem. It's a true story by the way. It's like Eminem was uh, at a restaurant and he went to go take a shit at the restaurant and he said, hand came up under the stall and said, Eminem, I know it's about time, but could you please just sign this autograph for my kid? And so he's taking a shit, signing an autograph. That is the worst kind of fame to me, the fame you can't turn off, where you can't take a shit in peace. My favorite kind of fame is niche famous, where you go to the conference and people go, I know you, I'm on your email list. I know you, and then you go home, and again, you're unknown. <laughs> you get to turn your fame on and off. And so that's the magic of doing uh, content long-term is you'll eventually become niche celebrity, but it's a long-term play. And anybody who, who approaches content without being in it for a year should give up because if you're not planning to, to do it for 12 months, just don't. And then my favorite way is the all the, the big audience owners already need more content. Like they don't, they're running out of stuff to say to their audience. So you just help them out by saying something valuable to their audience and on the back half of that, on step one, you give away the information for free. And on step two, people ask, can you do it for me? And you send them a video and go, here's how we would work together. That is my personal favorite way of doing it. And then amplify that later with paid ads. I think it's way more strategic. And this is a thing not enough people talk about in our space. But Jay Abraham's talked about it at length. He says that a strategic entrepreneur will crush a tactical entrepreneur all day long. And the difference between me to being what I would call chess and checkers. So like checkers is tactical. It's like you move left or right, you get to the end of the board, now you can go backwards. But like I could teach that to my four year old in 20 minutes, right? And they would get checkers. Chess, not so. Like people who are like real chess masters, like 20, 30 years, and they're still improving. And the, what differentiates a chess player from a checkers player is a really good chess player can think two, three, four, five moves in advance, right? They're not just thinking about their immediate move. So like for, for me, when I give away like valuable information to their audiences in, in, in my niche, I know on step two and step three, they're gonna ask for my help for the implementation. So I have no like nothing to hold back. I'm happy to give it to them. And like I, you mentioned the Loom videos, like I taught people for free how to make Loom videos every fucking day of the week. Somebody messages me and says, can you help me build mine? And yet I already gave it away for free. Like I, but it's, it's useless to people if they can't implement it, right? And so the devil's always in the details and they're like, I think I got it, but people aren't saying yes. Yeah, like, do I need to tweak this, change that? And they come to me, right? And so, but that's an example of that strategy. You give away the ideas and charge for the implementation. And it, for agency services, it's the simplest model. And by the way, the vast majority of chiropractors, also true in whatever niche anybody else listening to this is in, like, they want to be chiropractors. They don't want to be marketers. They don't want to be salespeople. They don't want to be doing SEO and Facebook ads and creating websites. They want to be adjusting people's backs and you know fixing health problems. Like that's what they're trained to do. So like, the more you give away ideas, they're they're only going to want your help to implement it, right? So uh, this this throws people off because a lot of times they think if they give them the ideas, they won't need to hire you, and it's really the opposite. Now you've demonstrated that you actually know how to do it. And, and all you need is a, like a clear, believable plan and process, and then you give away that as content. Like, so for example, like if I was hiring a guy to build a backyard deck, 
it's because I do not want to build a deck. And just so you know, these hands these hands are computer hands. These are not builder hands. Like, I, I want to be very, very clear that these are definitely nerdy computer hands, okay? But if a guy came to me and he was presenting his plan, it would, it would like, this is how I imagine it. He would say, all right, well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to measure this baby out. And the reason we're going to measure it is I need to know exactly how much lumber we would need to build this so I can tell you down to the penny how much this will cost. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to head over to Home Depot where they got a sale on lumber right now that lasts until tomorrow. I'm going to get it for you 25% off and we'll get all the lumber needed. Then we will come back tomorrow and we will build out the frame and put that all together. And then we will sand that baby down and put on the railings and stuff like that. And then we will stain that baby and you won't be able to touch it for a day or two while the stain dries. But as soon as that's done, about two, three days later, you're going to have a perfect deck and you can have all the backyard barbecues you want. Now, that is an example of the loom process. That guy is selling me backyard barbecues with my friends and he essentially gave me the process. Now, it's, when he gives me that process, do you think I want to go to Home Depot and buy that shit? Do you think I want to like measure that shit out? Like sit in the fucking 100 degree weather and measure it out? Fuck no! But he's giving me enough of the process that I believe he knows what the fuck he's doing. In fact, everything he said made sense to me. And so I'm more able to buy into it by his demonstration of I have a real tangible plan. So a lot of a Loom video people think is to sell your service, but it's actually to describe what you're going to do after you get hired. You're going to go, after you guys, after we get started, this is what we're going to build for you. Then we're going to do this. Then we're going to do that. And this is the sequence we're going to fall. And this is the outcome it's going to create. And this is who it works really well for. And this is how much it costs. You're actually describing what's going to happen after you get hired, not before. And you're demonstrating that with pictures so they can follow it. So, like, I don't know. For As far as, like, if I had a new agency and I wanted to scale it and go get clients, like, I would just use the strategy that most fits my personality. So either you're gonna do one-to-one -one outreach, usually works well if you like talking to people and having conversations and like learning lots about them. Um, I would do paid ads if I just wanna sit in a dark room and make my credit card like do the heavy lifting and not me. Um, although there's you know still a lot of work in figuring out like creatives and stuff like that, like getting those dialed in and working. If I wanted to um, like, you know, shoot my mouth off because I like doing that and, and depending whether like if I'm a written person, I would write it. If I was a video person, I would say it. If I was an audio kind of person, like I like having interviews, I would do it in podcasts, but I would create content if that was my style. And if I like just energy hacking it and bringing it to people like uh, people to me, then I would do the one-to-many audience outreach like I described. And it, it, that's kind of a combination of outreach plus content. But there's really, there's only so many ways. And then of course, like referrals and word of mouth. But we didn't really talk about that because the way most people get them, like they're not really in your control. But like, that's it. You're gonna get clients one of those ways. So it's up to you which way to do it. They all work, by the way. And, and they all have like learning curves and they all like, they, they don't work before they work. So meaning like the first time you run a paid ad, it won't work. The first outreach message you paid probably won't work. The first piece of content you make won't like catch. The first one-to-many audience message you send probably won't work, but it works long-term with consistency. So anyways, I hope that's helpful, my dude, because uh, you know that's really the playbook on doing this stuff. And uh, that's all we got for uh, questions, unless you guys got anything else you wanted to add real quick. I'm happy to stick around for a minute. But uh, tell you guys a little bit more about what I told you guys in the beginning, which is uh, we got a couple things going on right now. Uh, I sent an email about it this morning, but we have uh, some Stripe alternatives and PayPal alternatives because I've been hearing just so many horror stories of people got my account banned, Stripe froze my shit. They generally don't like agency services and their high fees and they're slow anyway. So, you know, part of my mission the last few months is like, let's, let's find somebody who actually works with us and our kind of people. So I've been building a database of that. I still need better international solutions, but that's part of my work for the next few weeks to figure that out um, as well. Um, I also have a swipe and deploy SEO email list. So we've created a lead magnet a landing page and a year's worth of email follow up for, for anybody who sells SEO. Like most of you guys know you should have a mailing list, but what you don't have is a fucking mailing list. So I built it for you and you can just use our swipe file and it's designed to address all their objections and reasons they say no. So I'm expecting that to uh, like anytime, like probably end of the week, uh, most likely be finished. And then as well, uh, we've been making some serious upgrades to the Wolfpack. I've been building AI tools like you wouldn't believe to be able to like create content, to be able to like personalize messages to people. And they're all written in my voice. I had to spend hours and hours and hours training AI how to write 
like I wanted to write, but now it's actually like really fucking good. And we can create content at the click of a button that's really good and pre-sells our stuff, like webinars and podcasts and video scripts and uh, magazine articles, all those kind of things. Uh, we can pitch people in seconds. We can find out who the audience owners are in a space. We got ad swipe files we can customize and personalize. Like it's it's pretty advanced where we're getting to. And I also uh, want to get to onboarding and all the delivery and fulfillment stuff. That's probably a three to six month project, but you know that's what we're working on because I want to make this shit cool as fuck and easy for you guys to implement. So that's all I got for you guys today. Happy Monday. Much love. May the force be with you. If you stuck around with me all the way to the end, hit a like button because it makes you cooler. Drop a comment. Just let me know that you guys listen to these and get something out of it so I keep making them. Otherwise, I'm going to die as an uh, old man with uh, a <laughs> bruised and battered ego. But a cool shirt that Lana bought me. May the beach be with you. Shout out to you, Lana. Anyways, that's all I got for you guys. Happy Monday. May the force be with you. Hey guys, if you like this video, you'll probably also like our free Facebook group, Beyond Agency Profits, Agency Lifestyle Design. Uh, you can get free copies of the book inside here. It's, I look ridiculous. We're doing weekly Q&As, giving answers to all your questions. Some of the best, smartest, brightest people. We've got lots of industry leaders doing seven, eight figures and beyond. It's a literal who's who of the brightest uh, agency owners that I know, as well as lots of tips on scaling and stuff, books that work. So if you're not already part of it, uh, you're going to want to be part of it. So make sure to click the link. I put it in the description of the video as well as in the pinned top comment below. So just scroll down and you can join and it's totally free.